If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button as well as the bell to be notified of future videos. Thank you. Hello Internet, I must tell you we are really, really privileged today. We have here a South African, he lives in New Zealand now. He's a man who is, uh, was a flight engineer in the SAF in 1962. That's only five years before I was a twinkle in my dad's eyes. And he's still as sharp as a pin. <laughs> and he went to New Zealand, he went to Australia, he did all sorts of things in that office, a, a captain, I believe, in the Royal uh, New Zealand Navy. And now his name, Arthur Floyd. If we were speaking Afrikaans, I would have said, well, but since we're speaking English, the reason for that is he wants, and I want his grandchildren and their children to listen to this, and they probably will not understand Afrikaans even though he speaks it better than me. So now I have to call him sir, or captain, I suppose. Tell me, sir, where are you from? And welcome at Legacy. Thank you for coming to us. And all your viewers, thank you very much for, uh, for inviting me to take part. And before I tell you where I'm from, me, myself, I would just like to tell you where my ancestors came from. Now, there are two, two sections, yeah? Uh, there's before nine, uh, 1744 and then after 1744. Before 1744, my ancestors, uh, you know, in, in those years, France and Belgium and Holland and uh, on, the west, on the eastern side of Holland, Germany, uh, the, 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 the borders were not rivers necessarily. Sometimes it's just a beacon or a pole, and that is the border. So my ancestors apparently left France or the southern part of Belgium because of religion. You know, they had the, this old uh, this old French king and the, the bishop, uh, the Cardinal Richelieu, they revoked the Edict of Nantes. Now, for those of you who don't, uh, who don't know what the Edict of Nantes was, it was an edict issued by a king, some France king, I don't know which one, that religion is free, it's a, it's a choice. You could belong to any religion that you prefer in France. And then when they revoked it, it means that everybody under French rule, must become Roman Catholic. That is history. You had a choice. You either become Roman Catholic or they made an appointment for you with Madame Guillotine and you lost your head. That is, that is what happened in history. So my ancestors were very scared of Madame Guillotine and they fled. They went to the, 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 the northwestern side of what is Germany today. My DNA, which I had analyzed, showed that I'm 67% German, and the rest is basically from Norway, Sweden, and Denmark, those areas. So that's where, that's where I come from, my ancestors. Now, they couldn't make a decent living uh, where they lived because of their experience, and they grew up on a farm, which... I presume was a wine farm because they were winemakers and uh, they fell under the Dutch rule at that stage and uh, that the Dutch sent them to South Africa. They landed in Cape Town in 1744. Uh, the old guy, Simon Deploy, was the first deployer on uh, African soil, as far as we know. And he settled himself in Stellenbosch uh, him and his wife, and uh, according to the history books, they had six boys, six children. Uh, when those boys grew a little bit older, uh, they went and farmed between what is today Wellington in, in the Western Cape, Wellington and Tilbach, but closer to Tilbach because their church was in Tilbach. 
And uh, I went to Tilbach years ago, and I had a look at the, uh, the church documents and uh, all their, their, the, the books that they had about membership and all sorts of things. And I found out that four of those boys were actually buried inside the church under the floor, which was the, the, the thing those years. They buried the people inside the church. So that's where, I don't know which ones were buried, but there were two left. And the next piece of history that I picked up was my great-grandfather. They found themselves somewhere in the Orange Free State, near where today is Betuli. And uh, they farmed there. And his farm actually straddled the Orange River. He had he had uh, land on the, on the Free State side and land on the Cape Province side. So at some stage, when my grandfather, my dad's father was, uh, was a youngster, the government approached him and they wanted to, uh, they wanted to appropriate the farm because they had plans to build a dam which eventually materialized. It was, used, it was called the Furvurt Dam. Today it's got some, some, some new name. But <clears throat> one, one item on the, on the agreement was that my grandfather established that the whole farm would not be covered by water, looking at the height of the dam wall. So they wrote into the agreement that the, the, the land, which is not covered by water, must become a game reserve. And that game reserve is still there today in Afrikaans. It's called the Viltain Tissentwee Refira. So it's the, the reserve between two rivers. That is still in today, and I hope it's still in good condition because they favored them. All right. My grandfather then, once they sold the, the farm to the government, they, had, uh, they were compensated for the farm, contrary to what is the situation today, where they just take your farm, or they can, they wanted to, but nevertheless, my grandfather went and settled in a place called Harry Smith in the, the, the north, on the southeastern border of the Orange Free State. It is, I'll tell you, it is the coldest place in winter that you've ever lived in. Now, I was born there on the 16th of June, 1941. In a few days' time, I'll be 81. And uh, that's where I got the fright of my life when I opened my eyes in the middle of winter underneath Plattberg, Plattberg which is the beacon of Harry Smith. And uh, I, I saw that this world that I've just entered is very, very cold. And since then, I tried to get away from the cold as much as I could. Nevertheless, the um, World War broke out or started in, on, in, in 1939. So I was, I was born in 41, so I was about 18 months or so old when the, when the war started and my dad signed up to the Air Force and he served in the Air Force uh, during the war. He fought in North Africa and, and Abyssinia, North Africa, Malta, in Palestine and in Italy. And eventually he developed some stomach problem and they sent him back to South Africa. Uh, that was in 1944, end of 1944. So I was already three years and a bit when he came back. And uh, we lived in Harry Smith for a while. Uh, I started school there uh, at Harry Smith School. Uh, those years it was called sub A and sub B and then standard one up to standard 10. So in today's terms, the kids talk about year one and up to year 12. So I was in year one, I was in Harry Smith. 
Then fortunately, my dad got another job in Durban and we moved to Durban. So my year two was in Durban. And there I went to Stella Park, pre-primary. So uh, it was, a, it was a, a dual medium. So we had Afrikaans-speaking kids and English-speaking kids. I don't know why, but we fought the, the Anglo-World War every playtime. We fought the war against the English. <laughs> I don't know who won, but nevertheless. So at the end of, of standard two, I went to the high school because Port Natal High School only had a high school. Uh, there was no primary school. They were busy building it. And I was in high school for for standard three and standard four. And then, no, for standard one and standard two. Yes, standard two and standard three. Because the primary school was, sorry, my short-term memory has gone AWOL. I really have to battle to remember everything. So please excuse me. Uh, I was only, I was in the primary school in my whole life, only for one year, because standard five, I had to go back to the high school again. And uh, from standard five to standard 10, those years, or to year 12, I was in Port Natal High School. But I did not finish school there, because <clears throat> as a hobby, oh, incidentally, there's something I must tell you. Uh, we were four boys, but I had the gift of the gab. And when I went to school, I was about nearly seven years old. Only then did I discover that my real name is not Shada. <laughs> I had another name. <laughs> okay. Um, so in Port Natal, I was a very average student, naughty, got into trouble a lot of times, but uh, I didn't. I didn't excel in anything because I, wherever the girls, wherever the girls went, I went. So if if they fancied rugby, I played rugby. If they fancied cricket, I played cricket. Nevertheless, um, we also had those years. We had school cadets. Every Friday, we had to wear our school cadet uniform and go to school with that, and. Uh, the, there were some of the teachers, they were our cadet officers, uh, lieutenants. There was a whole lot of lieutenants. And then we had the, 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 the vice principal was a major, Major Chadwick, a uh, very well-known historian in, in uh, Natal, which is now KwaZulu Natal. And if you look at photo two, uh, You'll see the school cadet. This is the first team and the only team of the sharpshooters. We used to partake in bizzlies and shoot against, not, we didn't shoot to them, or we shot against them for points. All the other schools, the high schools in Natal. At that stage, there was only three Afrikaans high schools in the whole of Natal. The one was in Freight, the other one in Peter Maritzburg, and then, of course, Port Natal in Durban. And in 1958, I dreaded school. I didn't like it because I was bored stiff. There were some subjects that I liked. I liked physics and, and science and maths but, and geology, geography, Ardrechtskunde, as we called it. I loved them, but the others, really, it was a drag for me. I felt that I was wasting my time. So, when I was in Standard 9, they had a, the, 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 they had a, a careers exhibition in the old uh, Durban Technical College, where all the employers came and exhibited their companies and so on, looking for, for, for people, for youngsters to choose a career. And when I, we, I attended that thing, and when I got to the Air Force stand, I just 
uh, lowered my anchor and stayed there the whole day. And I really pestered. There were two poor guys on duty there. And I threw questions at them. Now we're in my in the field that I have an interest in. Because at school, I used to build model airplanes from Spitfires to Tiger Moths. And uh, eventually, we flew them. I got a little engine for each one of them. And we, we, had, we flew them with two lines, uh, all in a circle. Uh, so I was very much into, into uh, airplanes. And when my dad came back from, from North Africa, he brought me a present. I hope you can see this. I'm going to show it. You see this? This is a model of a kitty hawk that he used perspex, the, 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 the windows of an airplane, and he laminated them. Now, if you, I don't know if you'll be able to see this on this little camera. You can see the lines inside there. That's where he laminated the perspex. And with a little hacksaw and a pen knife, he made me this kitty hawk. And I still got it today. This was made just after I was born. And uh, I'm very, very uh, honored to have this still from my dad. Uh, where was I? Okay. So I went home that night. And I spoke to both my parents and I said to them, listen, please bear with me. I am bored stiff with school. I want to go to join the Air Force. And I can finish my matric at 68 Air School. That is in the old Littleton area. And uh, after a lot of tears and convincing and my mom said to my dad, look, this guy has made up his mind. If we stop this now, what is going, probably be, going to become a, a push a broom in the streets or something, because this is all he wants to do. So my dad said, all right, but I want to see that matric certificate of yours or the standard 10 certificate, the senior certificate, we called it. In standard eight, you've got a junior certificate, and then in standard 10, you've got a senior certificate. So I said, okay, I'll do it. So I joined the South African Air Force. I went to Pretoria, first to Natal Command, and did all the forms and everything, medical and what, what you need to have. And uh, I walked into 68 Air School on the 3rd of May, 1958. And there's a photograph of me the first day in the SAF. Uh, we used to call ourselves Blow Hutter. That's the guys who just joined. And uh, uh, I was allocated into Bungalow 28A. And there's a photograph of all the guys in Bungalow 28A. Now, there's some interesting characters here. Uh, First of all, in the front row, sitting on the left-hand side, is Eric Fakel. Uh, a few of these guys may still be alive. I hope so. There's old Eric Fakel. And in the middle, sitting there, is uh, Andy Anderson. And that the last guy there in that front row is Fenter. I don't know his first name. I can't remember it. And then in the middle row is a guy... Bing Foster. Bing was his nickname. Uh, I don't know what his first name really was, but we called him Bing Foster. Now, I'll come back to Bing Foster later, because unfortunately, Bing died in an airplane crash, and I'll tell you all about that. And then the middle guy was the, yours truly. The guy next to me, I can't remember his name, and then there's another interesting character. His surname was Holloway. I don't know if Holloway is alive, but I don't, I'm sure he won't mind me telling you his story. Uh, but before I tell you his story, let's go through the list. Behind me is Ura Udendal. He had red hair and freckles. And that poor guy, his parents were quite wealthy. They lived in Johannesburg, and they bought him a motorbike. 
And he killed himself within a week that they got that motorbike. So it's very sad. He was quite a nice guy. The middle guy, I can't remember his name. And the other guy, the one there, now for a moment, that's, his name slipped my mind. Nevertheless, let's get back to Holloway. Now, there was, a, there was a, a very notorious guy in the Air Force. It was a Portuguese guy from Mozambique. His surname was Santos. Now, Santos joined the, aircraft, the, the Air Force, and then uh, he didn't like it much, so he went on AWOL, absent without leave, for more than a year. And eventually, they caught Santos in, in the old Lorenzo Marx, which is now Maputo. They caught him there, and they brought him to the, the, the border, Big and South Africa and Swaziland meet. I can't remember the name of that town. It's quite a well-known place, but nevertheless. And they took, our drill sergeant was our sergeant uh, Van der Marwe, Joe Van der Marwe, uh, and another guy. So the three of us went by train, and we took... Uh, we took charge of Santos. He was he was in 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 handcuffs, and uh, in the compartment. You know, if you if you drop down the the bed in the compartment, there's a silver ring with a slot in it. It's like a handle, and uh, old Joe handcuffed Santos one cuff around his his uh, left. Wrist and the other one through that slot, so Santos couldn't go anywhere. And uh, all right, we arrived safely in Pretoria. There, there was a, a truck picking us, uh, picked us up, and took us to 68 Air School because that was now on a Friday night that we arrived. So Santos was locked in the in the cell at where the the standby fire crew was housed. And Holloway was his guard. Now, the only weapon that the guard had was a bayonet with a white belt. You put it around your waist and this bayonet. Now, that is... Now, a prisoner is allowed one hour per day to walk around outside and get some exercise. So when the time came, the orderly NCO said to Holloway, take the prisoner for a walk. So off they went. But now it's it's dark. It's at night already. An uh, hour goes past, no Holloway, no Santos. Another hour, no Holloway, no Santos. And they sent us into the camp to go and look for them. It was very late that night when somebody found the bayonet with this white belt in, next to one of the ablution blocks in, in the bin where they keep the the coal to fire the 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 the, the donkey, the, that thing which you make a fire in to boil the water for the showers. So there they found it. Of course, now we know. We thought that Santos had really knocked Old Holloway on the head and ran away. But when they went to Holloway's bungalow, they found that his suitcase is gone and a lot of his so his clothes are gone and his uniform was lying on his bed. So it was quite obvious that Santos and Holloway ran away together, the guard and the prisoner. <laughs> and they, apparently they caught, they jumped on, 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 on the railway trucks and they found themselves, the next day they found themselves in, uh, in Lorenzo Marx again. So Holloway had uh, with Santos another year of freedom sleeping on the beach in, in Maputo. And uh, eventually they caught them again and delivered it. And I don't know what happened to Holloway. Uh, but he didn't have many worries because his, his father had a fishing fleet in Mossel Bay. I remember that so well. There's nothing wrong with my long-term memory, but it's my short-term memory that's on a wall. And, uh, but I never saw Holloway again. But he was a nice guy. I liked him. While we were at 68 Air School, apart from the basics, the drill and the running and the exercises, we had a lot of fun as well. 
uh, the senior apprentices would have shower parties for all the blowhatter. Now, a shower party takes place at about two o'clock in the morning. And uh, they come and hurl you out of bed and you've got to get naked. In front of the bungalow, there's a furrow for the rainwater to run down. And at the top of this thing, there's a, there's a fire hydrant. So they'd open the fire hydrant and let that icy, icy cold water run down that furrow. And we had to swim in the furrow. <laughs> but you get so cold. Eventually, they called us off, and then we all run to the showers to get a hot shower. When we get there, we realize that they had drained that donkey, and there's no hot water. So we had a cold shower as well. We were nearly dead. But nevertheless, that was a bit of fun. And then something else which always stands out in my memory. There was a guy with us by the name of Jerry von Wiesel. Now, he finished his career in the Air Force. He was eventually, the last time I knew where he was, uh, he was a 28th squadron, and he was a flight engineer on Skymasters and eventually on the Boeing that the Air Force had, on Jerry von Wiesel. Now, a real character of a guy. And Joe van der Merwe was our drill sergeant. So we were marching from the parade ground at 68 Air School back to the, the living quarters, the camp, which is across the road. And old Jerry had a, had a walk on him that looked like a pregnant duck. He would waddle. He couldn't walk. And old Jerry really tried his best to teach this guy how to march properly. Eventually, he got so sick of it, and he was walking next to the flight or the you know, in the Air Force, we call a squad a flight. And he took his space stick and he just tapped Jerry von Wiesel on the head. And Jerry stepped right out of the flight and stood still. And he, oh, Joe stopped us and he went and he said, von Wiesel, what's your problem? He said, Sergeant, if you, if you assault me again with that stick, I'm going to defend myself. I warn you. I'll defend myself. <laughs> and now Joe was very surprised about this reaction from Jerry. But all's well that ends well. And then there was another incident, which is hilarious. We had a guy, his name was Jakes. I can't remember his surname. But Jakes came from a small free state town. The only uniform he ever saw was the police sergeant. And everybody in town talked about sergeant. Not he, they didn't use his surname or any, just sergeant. If they call, if they talk about sergeant, everybody knows that they're talking about the police sergeant. But to Jake's, it meant to him that anybody who's in a uniform, you address him as sergeant. So when he joined the Air Force, whether you're a corporal or a general, he addressed you as sergeant because you've got a uniform. And uh, we had a drill sergeant also by the name of uh, Mostert. What was his first name? It slipped my mind now. But he had a nickname. It's called Piagra. You know, Piagra in South Africa is a is a uh, antiseptic uh, a liquid, which is black, but if you put water with it, it turns like a dirty white. Uh, and we used to, you use it on the farm as well to dip the animals and get rid of all the, the ticks and flies. But that was his surname because he had sort of purplish uh, marks on his cheek. And uh, old Viagra, couldn't stand this. He's a flight sergeant. Now, this guy talks about talks to him and he calls him sergeant. And he explained to him so many times, do you see this little star above the stripes? That means I'm a flight sergeant, not just a sergeant. And the third or fourth time he called him sergeant, he said, listen, whoa, do you see those trees around the parade ground? Now you go and climb up one of those trees until I tell you to stop. And he went right to the top 
And the tree, the top of the tree was swaying backwards and forwards. He says, now you shout, shout flight sergeant. So this poor guy sat in this tree the whole drill period for over an hour shouting flight sergeant, flight sergeant. Now, eventually when he got down, it doesn't matter whether you're a corporal or a general. In his mind, you are now a flight sergeant. <laughs> so the poor guy, he couldn't get this out. He couldn't fathom out how this works. Also, we had a Q stores. Now, Q stores is the store where they keep the bedding and the uniforms and the blankets and stuff like that. Now, Q store sergeant was a well-known guy, old Frick the Prayer, the rugby player. He was a sergeant then, and uh, that's where I met. Obviously, then, uh, he didn't play for the Springboks. He played for defense and for the Air Force team, and he also played for Northern Transvaal. And he remained a sergeant. And when he got Springbok colors, the next week, oh, oh, Frick the Prayer was walking around and he was a full lieutenant. So suddenly he got his commission and he was promoted to the officer's ranks. Uh, another character at 68 Air School was our RSM, a very good old man. He was real father to us old Sergeant Major Specky de Villiers. He was, a, he, was, he was as tall as he was broad, or he was as broad as he was tall, but a very well-known, a very lovable old man. Very strict, but very fair. Very good old man. Okay, at the end of 1958, we had finished all our basic training. We've done basic workshops and so on to to enter the trade uh we were well, i was apprentice fitter aircraft uh there were radio mechanics and instrument mechanics and all sorts of all the trades we were mixed up together but we the, obviously we did different different workshops and uh, on wednesdays we were at school the normal apprentice school like they had many years i don't know if they still do it one day a week you go to school um so in january of 1959 i was posted to the central flying school at Donata. and if you look at the photograph you'll see a harvard there those were the aircraft that they trained the pilots on and that harvard there is a very famous Harvard. The number is 7111. Now, its nickname was Nelson. Why was it called Nelson? Because Nelson had one eye, one arm, and one arsehole. Sorry for that, but that was Nelson. So this plane was 7111 of Nelson. Many of the old guys will remember Nelson. Our officer commanding there was a commandant, which is now Lieutenant Colonel. But those years we called him commandant, Commandant Kuis de la Rey. For those of you who knows the South African history of it, his grandfather was the very famous General Kuis de la Rey. Now he was shot by a policeman, not intentionally, but at those, that time, there was a gang of robbers, and bank robbers, and real bad guys. They were called the Foster Gang. They roamed Johannesburg and the surrounding areas. And uh, they put up a roadblock. And uh, General De La Rey and a couple of other guys were in a car going... I think from Vereniging area towards Pretoria. And when they got to this roadblock, they thought that this is now serious problems and the driver put his foot down and, and uh, drove right through the roadblock. And one of the police took, a, took a, a rifle, lifted up and shot at the back of this car and hitting General De La Rey in the head and killed him there. So that was a sad day in the history of South Africa because he was well liked and a, quite a good guy, General Delaray. But his grandson now was my OC, 
And if you look at the photograph of the old general and Kuis de la Rey, my OC, they looked like brothers. They, are, they look just alike. Another in, uh, interesting character at uh, Central Flying School at the Nota was Maniki's Ru, the famous uh, center, Springbuck Center. He was a, he was an instructor there, pilot instructor. And on Wednesday afternoons, we had sports parade. So every Wednesday, we had to partake in some sport. And quite a few of us played touch rugby. We couldn't play rugby because then we would hurt each other. So they said, you can play rugby, but touch rugby. And of course, Maniki's Ru was in the opposite side. We were 15 apprentices, young apprentices. And then there were, and the other team was a couple of pupil pilots and a few of their uh, instructors. And that's where I played rugby against Maniki's Ruth, touch rugby for that matter. But I always tell my grandchildren that, you know, uh, I'm not the bad guy that you guys think I am. I played rugby against Maniki's Ruth without giving them further details. <laughs> One of the jobs, part-time jobs that I had there was I operated the local movies now. Because the not a, because the Central Flying School is not in a town, it is close to the Notta, and it's also fairly close to Springs. But you've got to drive there. But we had the, our own movies in in Central Flying School. Uh, the hall was furnished with old Dakota seats, the old canvas Dakota seats, and I was up. In, on, in the mezzanine operating the, 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 the projector there. Now, normally a, a, a film of those years was, was on two rolls. So you put the first roll up and let it run until that runs out and then you switch on the lights and then you put the second roll up and you show the rest of the film. But I met a girlfriend there. I had a girlfriend there, very nice girl. Oh man, she was a beaut. And uh, she used to sit with me up in the projection room on Saturday nights. We never watched the movies. It's only when the people in the, in the seats below started whistling and shouting that I realized that the reel was finished. So I quickly switched on the lights and changed the reel. But we never saw a full film. Nevertheless, I will skip the rest of that, of that story. Um, at CFS, we all, there was also a hangar uh, where they housed two World War II airplanes, German airplanes. Uh, ME-262, the first jet fighter, was housed there. A, it was a, they got it from Germany. They shipped it out to South Africa. And there was also a Stosch. That's a spotter plane, a German spotter plane. And we were given chance to, to, to every second Wednesday or so to go and pump up their wheels, their tires. Because remember, they dated from the Second World War. So they were losing air. We had to go and wash them down, all the, the bird droppings and dust and dirt that collected on them and keep them in good nick, pump their tires and so on. So uh, that's where I met up with the 262. And then also at 68, another hilarious incident. Um, there was a guy, one of our journeymen that we worked under. Now he had a name and his nickname was Jock Mahwate. I don't know in which language, one of the, one of the indigenous black languages Mahwati means a man that talks dirty, that swears a lot. But oh, that name fitted old Jock Mahwati. He used to swear in rhymes. And uh, it came in, he had to take them around and show them you know, all around the Harvards. Because we were just working on Harvards then. All the training aircraft. Now, have you ever looked at a pilot wearing a flying suit? 
you'll notice that the front zipper, you can open that from the top down or from the bottom up. Now, that is a very important zipper with a button. You can open it from the bottom up. Because sitting in a, in a fighter airplane, there's nowhere to go. If you have to go and you've got to go, you're in trouble. So what they did on the, at the, on the belly of the hob, but they mounted a Venturi. Uh, and underneath the pilot's seat is a little funnel. And the two are connected with a plastic pipe. So if you want to have a wee, you just zip up your flying suit from the bottom up. Take out the little man, shove it into this funnel and do your thing. And while the airplane is flying, then the suction caused by the Venturi obviously sucks that tube dry. And uh, you are relieved. You can then zip your zipper down. Now, we were taught that a lot of the aircraft instruments work on vacuum. And when the UAPs arrive, they all knew this, but they've never seen it. So old Jock would get into the plane, into the cockpit, sit there, and he'll tell the happy to go down. And that adventure you you take off the pipe. It's a little jubilee clip that you undo and you can slip the pipe off. He wants to check the instrument. So you've got to suck. You've got to suck all the air out of that pipe. And that guy sits there and he sucks and he sucks. And uh, about a week or two later, he will find out that where he sucked was actually at the end of the piss tube. <laughs> <laughs> so that was Jock Mahwati. Now that was the time when trouble started in the black townships. Uh, CFS was the closest to some trouble spots. And perhaps I shouldn't do this, but I'm going to do it. They used to bomb these crowds with, with flower bombs. And the harbors would go and fly very low over these crowds that are now shouting all sorts of things. Well, twice it happened when a harbor came back with a tremendous vibration. What we found was it had a chip in the propeller. So they went over those crowds so low that as they threw stones at the plane, it actually, they actually hit the plane in the propeller. We had to, they, in the old days, there, was, there were some guards, some old black guys walking with ESSA guys, the, guarding the gates and the fences and so on. And then suddenly these guys were just gone. And we all wondered where, what happened to all these guards now? They, we had to do the night, the night shift. We had, they, they issued these apprentices with, with sten, uh, sten guns. Now, a sten gun is a machine gun. It's the cheapest, it's the cheapest armament, armament, armament that they produced during the Second World War. It had a magazine full of 25 bullets in there. Now, if you, if you cock it and you knock it hard, it would start firing by itself. So it was a very dangerous thing. And the people who lived close to the fence uh, at CFS, they were all Air Force people, but they were so jittery about these apprent two apprentices patrolling this fence with sten guns. <coughs> oh, excuse me. So... Um, I'll stop this. Excuse me, I just want to take a sip. Stop this, this uh, thing with Senga. They gave us each of the old 303. And we were still 2-2. Two, two. So one night I was on duty, on guard duty, with Jock Mahwati. Now, CFS runway was gross. The whole, the whole aerodrome was gross. So they had tractors mowing this grass 
and uh, it was dumped in one huge heap. It was really, it was the height of a house, this heap of cut grass. And we went, we, the spot where they wanted us to patrol was close to one of these things. So he said to me, listen, <clears throat> to hell with this marching around. We're going to climb on top of that and we can see the whole world from there. So, I, so we battled our way up, up this heap of grass and we were lying there, there quite relaxed. And we saw this dark shadow approaching from the hangars. It wasn't those old army fords. They were painted dark green. And it looked just like a shadow. And he said to me, here they come. Now, that was the orderly officer and the orderly NCO. They, they now check on these guards. So they stopped close to us. Obviously, they can't see us. They never expect us to sit on top of this heap of grass. And... Uh, the orderly officer went in one direction and the, the NCO guy went in the other direction and met up and they couldn't find us. So as they were walking away towards the car, old Jock Mahwati said, said, shouted, now I'm not going to use the, the word he used because it's very naughty. And he said, halt you bastards, I've got you covered. <laughs> now you can put the right word in there if you like. Nevertheless, also, the Notta, which was about five, between five and 10 kilometers off the, from, from CFS, uh, they had a drive-in theater. Now, those of you who can remember drive-in theaters, you drive in there with your car, you park next to a little pole, there's a mic, there's a, a a loudspeaker on it and you unhitch this and then you put it hang it in your car and you could you could watch the driving but uh, uh, quite a few of us already had girlfriends you know some of this the air force staff had beautiful daughters so we dated them and they loved this so one day one of near the fence of uh, the airfield films there was a there was a black family and this guy had a donkey cart and two donkeys so we went around one day and we spoke to him. We said to him, listen, we want to hire your donkey cart. And he was, he was quite happy about this. And we hired this donkey cart. And uh, we got these girls and we loaded them up on the donkey cart one evening. And here we go down to the Nota and we go to the drive-in with this donkey cart. First of all, they wouldn't allow us into the gates. They wouldn't sell us tickets. They said, no, you can't go in because the donkeys are going to leave a lot of dung inside there. We said, no, 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 no. We've got a spade and we've got a bag. We'll pick it all up. And so eventually we convinced the guy that, and they allowed us in. So there we sat on this donkey cart watching the, watching the, um, the movie that night. It was quite, quite hilarious for the people around. It was the talk of the town. Air Force coming with a donkey cart to the drive-in. Um, other than that, we learned how to do first-line servicing on Harvards. Nothing much happened. Well, a lot happened, but uh, it will take too long to relate it all. Those were some of the enjoyable moments I had at 68 at uh, CFS. Uh, we made good friends there, which I still have today. It was very nice. Nevertheless, uh, we were there for nine months. And then they transferred us. Some guys went to Watercliffe. And uh, I was amongst a lot that was transferred to Swartkops, Swartkops Airfield. And there we were posted to the, the Dakota hangar. And we, we did second line servicing, the more intricate servicing on Dakotas. We stripped and we, we inspected and we built and we renewed and we fixed up and on Dakotas. We learned all about Dakotas, the wonderful old the first Dakota that was built was the same year that I was born. 
and I, I'm, I may be wrong, but I think there's still some of them flying. And subsequently, they have changed. They have changed the Dakota. They've modified it. They took the Pratt and Whitney engines off, and they fitted uh, turbine prop turbine engines on them and lengthened the nose a bit. But they were still after they 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 grounded the Shackletons uh, and also the Mackies. Those those the, they had those two engines with a with a pusher prop. They used the, the, the Dakotas, which was now completely modified. Now, while I was at, one, at uh, Swatkops, uh, not much happened there, except that we were still doing guard duty. We got, we got a lot of so many, at least one night a week and one day a week, one night a week most of the time, because during the day, the base is full of, of guys walking around so we could see anything that was, shouldn't have happened or shouldn't enter. But at night, everybody's sleeping, so we were doing night duty. And uh, they, they taught, uh, taught us to drive little ferrets. Now, a ferret is a scout car. It had a massive engine in a Rolls Royce. I think it was a straight six or something like that, but it had a very powerful engine in it. And uh, we were taught to drive these ferrets. Now, the peculiar thing about these ferrets is that the steering wheel was the wrong way. Instead of tilting away from you, it tilted towards you. So you had the top part of the wheel to hold on and to steer this little car. That's one peculiar thing. And the second thing, it had a very peculiar gearbox. It's a pre-select box. So there were two gear handles. The one is for the one handle, you push it forward and you drive forward. The other then if you push it back, you're in reverse. The other handle is a selector handle. So if you want to pull away now and drive forward, you put the one forward and the selector you'll put in the first gear. But it doesn't go, it goes into gear, but you don't feel it. Then it's got, instead of a clutch, it's got a selector pedal. So to get it into gear and drive, you've got to press that pedal in and release. So you just kick the pedal and off you go. And then in the meantime, you can put it in the selector in second. And when you want to go into second, you just kick that pedal. And you had five gears forward. And if you put that main lever back, you had five gears in the reverse. So <laughs> very peculiar little little ferret. It was quite a heavy vehicle, but uh, very nice to drive. And this engine used to sing. It would sing you to sleep. It's a beautiful Rolls Royce. But um, obviously, we're young, full of fun. And there were two guys on the ferret. The one is the driver and the other one is the lookout. So the, the turret hatch that was taken off and they mounted a spotlight, a very bright spotlight there. So the guy standing behind the driver, he, uh, there was a little seat that you can stand on with your knees. So you can't sit down and you can't see at the turret, but you, could, you can sit on your knees. And he operated the spotlight and we were supposed to patrol the fence and uh, look for anything out of the ordinary around the fence. But of course, Swartkops is also, most of the airfield is grass. So there's lots of rabbits. And uh, we were hunting rabbits with these ferrets in the spotlight. <laughs> and I was the driver one night and we were really gunning it after this rabbit. Now, where the driver looks out, there's just a little slot in front of you. So you can't see much. You just see what is in front of you. And you rely on the back, the guy at the back of you to guide you. Uh, he's operating the spotlight. And uh, we're gunning it. And suddenly it was as if a big hand grabbed hold of the spirit and held it back. I couldn't understand what was going on now. We, eventually we stopped and the engine died. We got out and we walked around 
We couldn't see anything. I opened the engine covers, nothing. So I took the torch and I lay on my back and I looked underneath. You know, they had changed the fence wire. I don't know when, but long before that, that time. And this wire was lying, this bob wire was lying in the grass, rusted bob wire. And of course, you can't see it from the ferret where you, the driver is. And the grass is about knee high. So I picked up this wire, this bob wire, and it wound around the rear axle. Now, if I say a ball of wire, I mean a ball twice the size of a soccer ball, of bob wire pulled so tight that it got that thing to stop and kill the engine. No way that you can get that wire off where we were. So we had to, uh, we had to walk to the, the, the orderly room and report, say so them this and there, there, the ferret, the ferret is standing there. You better send the low bed and the crane to get him here because there's no way you're going to throw him or push him or what, which they did the next day. Those guys battled for hours to get that bob wire off that axle. So that was the, the ferret and uh, the, the, the rusty wire. Um, now, something else. Where Swart Corps was based, there's no public transport. So to go into Pretoria town, you had to walk on the old Johannesburg road to a place, Crossroads. That's where the, the road comes up from Snake Valley, from the old Verwurtburg side or Littleton side, cross the Johannesburg road into, into uh, Fort Tracker uh, Heights. Now it's got a Funny name, I can't pronounce it. Um, so you had to walk up there and then into the heights and catch the municipal bus to go to town. This was very, very uncomfortable to do. So I scraped all my savings together and I bought my first car, which was this 1950 Citroen. The gear lever came out of the dashboard. The bonnet... It was two lids on the bonnet. They opened from the side. The gearbox of this car is right in front, just behind the radiator. That's where the gearbox is. And from your the handle inside the car, the gear stick, which is inside the dash, it was linkages, little aluminium pipes that ran all the way past the engine to the gearbox, the selectors on the gearbox. That was the... The car. That was my first car. Very nice car to drive because it was front wheel drive. Uh, very nice engine. And the first night, the first uh, Friday night that I had the car, we were five guys in the car. We went to Biscope in town to the old capital Biscope in town near the near the church, near, near the, 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 where old, old Paul Kruger's statue is, uh, near there. But <clears throat> I couldn't park well, and yet I find an open parking spot quite close to the, the bicycle. We parked there happily, went to the bicycle, enjoyed it. Now, all the bicycles those years had a pub. So when come interval, you can go around into the pub and have a beer or two beers or three beers, whatever you like. And then after intermission, you come back and you're off sozzled and you can sit and for the rest of the week. Perhaps you fall asleep. Something nasty that happened one night. Um, we went out for a beer and there was one guy with us. I won't mention his name. He had a bit too much to drink, and he came back after the main show had started, and he was fumbling in the dark to get the seat. Eventually, he flopped down, and we were right in. We didn't have money, so we bought the cheapest seats, which was right in front of the of the uh, auditorium. And yeah, this guy comes and plonks him down on his seat, and it wasn't long after that 
and he started getting sick. So he caught it with his hands. He caught this and he dumped it on the lady's lap next to him. <laughs> it was hilarious. But she really, she climbed into him and knocked seven pieces of hell out of him. But nevertheless, when we got out of the, the when the bicycle was finished, we got to the car and there's a piece of paper on my front window. It was a, a traffic fine. 25 rand. Now, I got 48 rand a month. That was my pay. And here I get a fine for 25 rand. It was virtually impossible for me to pay this fine. Now, we made a plan. So what we did, we caught the next bus back to Fort Tracker Wurte and uh, when we went back to camp, we found the police. We said the car is stolen. We had in front of SWAT cops where our park it. They took all the details on the phone. They said, right, they'll, they'll see if they can find it. And uh, after work started the next morning, I was called to the front gate. And there's a police sergeant, and he says to me, listen, we found your car. You are so lucky. We found your car. It's in Pretoria. I said, yes. Can you give me a lift? And they put me in, <laughs> bundled me into the police car, took me to town, and there's my car. Still with the ticket under the windscreen wiper. <laughs> and I took this ticket out and I said to the sergeant, I said, then what about this? He just give it to me, I'll sort it out. So I drove my car back home to the camp and I never heard anything. <laughs> so that's the easy way to pay your fine. <laughs> Report your car stolen. <laughs> but uh, also at, at, uh, at the SWAT Corps, we serviced the old Venturas. Now, that wasn't a, a well-known airplane. It was called the PV Ventura. A twin-engine bomber. Uh, now, if you look at the next photo, you'll see the two Venturas flying over the harbor in Cape Town. That is what they looked like. Um, they also had Pratt & Whitney engines. Now, Pratt & Whitney was a very, very famous aircraft engine manufacturer. It still is today. They make beautiful engines. But uh, with, I met up with them in the Air Force. The Harvard had a Pratt & Whitney single wasp. It had nine cylinders in, in a radial configuration, <coughs> delivering about 500 horsepower. The old Dakotas had a double wasp, which was two rows of cylinders, but there was only seven in a row. So it had a total of 14 cylinders per engine. And then the Venturas had the twin wasp, which is like two Harvard engines stuck together. It had 18 cylinders in two rows. So a very powerful engine. Oh. And I was fortunate to be one of a team that serviced this particular last Ventura. We didn't know it at the time. And when we were when 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 we did the finish the service, it had to go for a test flight. And our pilot was a very famous guy, old Major Porky Rich, very well known. He was also a pilot in Korea and a well-known guy in the SAP. Unfortunately, he passed away quite a long time ago. But he was our pilot, and that was the one and only flip I ever had in the Ventura. It was a, uh, a test flight with Porky Rich. Uh, we were at Spotkovs for six months. We were transferred to number one air depot. Now, number one air depot is the number one air depot. That's where they service the planes. They do the major overalls on planes. 
during the after the Second World War, a lot of the coders came back to South Africa. They took the main planes off and they inhibited the engines. That means pumping them full of inhibiting oil and spraying the engines on the outside with this inhibiting oil so that it doesn't pick up any corrosion. And they stored them at 15 air depot, which is uh, across the road from Swatkops in what is known as Snake Valley. And there they were stored in hangars. I don't know, but there were plenty of them. Um, and what they would do is they would pull out one of those old Dakotas, tow them up to one air depot, uh, and we would strip them, take everything out. And under the floorboards, you often found Egyptian coins and all sorts of small things that fell out of the guys who were flown back after the Second World War, fell out of their bags or pockets or whatever, and uh, landed up underneath the floorboards. We used to strip these things down to the last bolt and nut and rebuild them, and then put they were put back into commission. And whenever they needed another Dakota, they just flew one of those out. Now, at one air depot, we got, we got into serious training. The workshop <clears throat> in that depot, you can do anything to an airplane that needs to be done. I'll just name a, a, some of the workshops that we were trained in. We had the engine stripping shop. Engines used to come in. There you strip it, bolts and nuts, and everything was taken apart every single part and then they were put in in uh, in degreasing tanks all those bits and pieces which was filled with that liquid i'll come i'll, I'll remind myself just now again but this this stuff carbon tetrachloride carbon tetrachloride that's right now that has the property of evaporating at room temperature. So you pour this carbon tetrachloride into these huge bins and halfway up in the bin, there's a row of copper pipes fixed to the side walls and they pump ice cold water through those pipes. So the fumes, as the carbon tet evaporates, the fumes rise, the fumes rise until they reach the height of those cold pipes and then they condense and they drop back as, as little droplets. So it never comes out because it's highly dangerous. Uh, another thing about carbon tet is that they use it in fire extinguishers. But when you put it on your hand, when you pour a little bit on your hand, it, this, you get the sense of benzene, which is a highly flammable liquid. It evaporates shoof, just like that. And we used to tell the guys that this is the stuff you put in your cigarette lighter. Now, excuse the word, but we each one of us had a cigarette lighter. Those old ones with the cotton wool that you had to put benzene or some flammable liquid onto it and then strike it, and then you can you can light your cigarette with the pipe. And because each one of us had one of those, we called it the poopo. Also, <laughs> because we each had a poopo. <laughs> and of course, when the guy put that carbon tetrachloride in there, it will never fire up because they use it in fire extinguishers. <laughs> All right, we had the, the uh, stripping shop. We had the engine assembly shop. We had the rubber and plastic shop where we made all sorts of seals and canopies for the sabers, etc. We had the fabric shop where we learned to do, do needlework. Now you would wonder why would the fitter do needlework? Because the harvests and the Dakotas, their control surfaces, that means the, the rudder and the ailerons and the elevators, were just aluminium frames and they covered with fabric. And then you, once you cover it as tight as possible, then you would wet it with water and it would shrink. And then you can 
then you can uh, you can paint it and it it becomes very hard like a very thin piece of metal like a, a sheet of metal because it's light and easy to maintain that's what they did it they used it for and uh, so we learned all that in the fabric shop we also went to the sheet metal shop something i must put in here you know when you assemble any aircraft parts where bolts and nuts and screws and stuff like that is used on each one of them there are thousands there is some locking device now today we also use locking devices even on your car you've got a, a nylock nut which has a, a ring of nylon in it so when you tighten it it won't vibrate loose on an aircraft every bolt and nut if you if it doesn't have a nylock it had a castellated nut and there's a hole through the shaft of the of the bolt so you tighten it and then you take a piece of locking wire which is a special wire you put it through that shaft and then you you twist it six twists per inch and then you near that nut there's always a, a a little lug or some place where you must put the other end of the wire through and twist that so that the nut cannot turn anti clockwise the wire keeps it tight so you tighten it and then you lock it each and every nut and bolt is locked metal workers when they patch up the the the, the, the on the fuselage anything aluminium is patched uh it's riveted on now even the rivets have a locking device what they do is they drill a hole for the rivet it's an exact hole the rivets are kept in a fridge at 4 degrees celsius so the guy if he drills 12 holes he'll quickly go to the fridge take out 12 rivets put them in the holes and then they rivet it with rivet guns it's a it's a little hammer gun it works with with uh, with compressed air and the dolly on the other side of it and you rivet it and now when the rivet uh gets to room temperature obviously as it heats up it swells so that rivet will sit you'll never get it out you have to drill it out so even the rivets on the aircraft has a locking device on them and then we also spent time in the propeller shop now propeller is not just the propeller as you would think it is uh, it has a gearbox in it in the front because you've got to the the the, the crankshaft rotates in a in a linear manner and you've got to change that to drive the propellers <coughs> excuse me gearbox on there and also propellers are have hydraulics in it to be able to change the pitch of the propeller and if you think if you wonder why a propeller is painted black with a white tip a uh, yellow tip is because black does not reflect any color so it absorbs all the colors so if you paint the propeller if you leave it silver or painted any color it would distract the pilot because he would be seeing this out of the corner of his eye he would be just... okay 10% of my battery is left so the, the 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 yellow tip is put on the end of the propeller so that the black paint doesn't run off it now that's just a joke it's so that it forms a little yellow ring and you can see the damn propeller is turning we also did time in the plating shop where we we learned how to chrome plate and galvanize and uh, all the different plating that you use on on airplane parts to stop corrosion and then we had the test bench where any all the engines that were rebuilt went to the test bench and you would mount that engine and connected to the control room via its controls and you can start the engine and run it and do all the tests as prescribed by the manufacturer to make sure that engine is in a in a good condition at the end of 
one air depot, we went back to 68 Air School for the final three months of our apprenticeship. And that was a three month theory. Every Friday you wrote exams and uh, that was the end. If you pass all the exams, uh, you are then invited to attend the uh, graduation parade and uh, which was normally officiated by the chief of the Air Force. And you walk away there as a qualified artisan. That is a very proud day. It's four years of training, hard labor, lots of, of hard study, lots of jokes and lots of laughter, and twice as many beers. So now we were qualified. I was chosen. I was very fortunate to be chosen. We were nine guys chosen to take the helicopter course so that we can go and uh, commence our training at 17 Squadron in Cape Town on helicopters to become flight engineers. So uh, I was transferred to Cape Town first time in my life that I went to Cape Town. Lots of things happened there. And if you look at the next photograph, you'll see the nine of us standing there in front of an Alouette 3. I will go through their names because there's some of these guys are still alive. In the front row on the left-hand side is Justin Menger. He was, I think he retired as a colonel. I'm not sure. The next two guys, I cannot remember their names. And then the last one, his name was Jakes. Now, I've spoken about Jakes before, but that was Jakes. And the back row, back row is of Bill Besaidenot. He, he passed away, and then it's yours truly. And then there was uh, uh, Jimmy Dupree. Jimmy Dupree, he became an ATC, an air traffic control officer at Petersburg later. The next guy, I can't remember his name, and the last guy in the back row is Akrobla. He was, also became a technical officer, and he retired as a colonel. And uh, we did our training on Alouette twos and threes. Now, if you look at that photograph, you'll notice right uh, behind uh, Justin Menger's right shoulder, there's a, a helicopter standing there. That's an S-55. Uh, when, I, when I was there, we had two of them. And the previous one before that, the first helicopter that the SAP bought was a was two S-51s. They both had Harvard engines in them. That was the S-51s and then the S-55s. Now, the S-51 that I met up with was A-1, the very first helicopter that was in the Air Force. And there's a very interesting story about the way I was involved with S, with the old A-1. Now, S-51, the one that I was involved with didn't have main rotor blades. These blades are made, manufactured as a set. In the, at, the, at the factory, they, they balance them statically and dynamically. So you cannot break up a set. If one blade gets damaged, you take the whole set and you send it back to the factory. Or they, you buy a new set. Now, S-50, the old A-1, uh, they, damaged, they damaged the one blade when they pulled him into the hangar one day. And he was standing there for I don't know how many years without blades. And because of the sanctions and all the political nonsense, we couldn't get blades from America. And then one day, we ran across a set of S-51 blades, and the Air Force immediately jumped in and bought them. They arrived at the uh, 17 Squadron, and we were all very happy. S-1, uh, A-1 is going to fly again. We fitted them. Uh, they were test run. They were tracked. Now, to track a helicopter blade, the three blades, on the end of each blade, there's a little knob. And what you do is you take an ordinary school crown that the kids use to color in. Uh, a yellow one, a blue one, 
and a green one. And each blade had a color. So you mark on each blade the, the relevant color. And then you have a tracking stick, which is nothing else but a pipe. And at the end of the pipe, there's a rubber flag, a very rigid little rubber flag. You put some masking tape on the edge of that flag, and while you ring, while you run the, the, the helicopter, you engage the rotors so that they turn. And at certain revs, you 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 touch the edge of the blade with that flag. And it, as the blades come by, they 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 each mark this on this uh, masking tape. And when you look at it, you can see whether the, a blade is, is uh, flying high or flying low. And you can adjust that with a special tool where you simply bend the trailing edge of the blade, a small piece of the trailing edge up or down until you get all three blades exactly the same plane. Otherwise you will get severe vibrations. So all that was done. And the only pilot that they could still trace that had a, uh, that was allowed to fly the old S-51 was a guy by the name of Clive Morgan. He was a lieutenant. He was rather, he was in his 50s already. Why he was a lieutenant until then, I, I don't know. But he was Lieutenant Clive Morgan. Now, he, he put my name down. And uh, we were supposed to go and fly this S-51, this old A-1. So we started up, did everything that was necessary, and taxied out. Now, this is an oyster plot in Cape Town. In summer, you have the southeaster blowing. And that can really blow like hell. And uh, sitting inside that helicopter, you don't realize what speed the wind is blowing and it's also gusty it's not the constant same speed so as we passed the hangar a gust came and tipped us over and we landed on our side and this new set of blades was smashed to smithereens everybody was in tears and then years later i was driving through woodstock that is a very bad suburb of cape town and there's a scrapyard there, clicks scrap metal. And what do I see? There's a one standing on a stand advertising clicks scrap metal. When I went home that evening, I wrote a letter to the chief of the Air Force. And I said, I am so ashamed. This is what I saw today. And I gave him the whole story. Two years later, a1 was gone from chick scrap metal. Then I heard later on it was in the Air Force Museum in Pretoria. And that really made my day. So. Well, Internet, we've come to the end of this episode. There's going to be more. I'm sure you have a lot of questions for Wim Ott. And I'm so glad that we recorded this. I mean, this goes back to when? Late 1950s, early 1960s. Many of us would not even have been born. Those who were born by that time were very, very small, you know, like toddlers. But here we're talking to a man and there's nothing wrong with his memory, I can tell you that. But sadly, what happened here in the background is that his battery on his phone uh, uh, ran down. And even though we plugged it in, it will take a little bit of time to, to, get, it, to get it going again. And of course, it's now there about really not all post three in the morning. I made a mistake with my maths. I thought, I don't know what I was thinking. That's why I became an attorney and a policeman and later wrote a few books because I can't do maths. I'm really useless at it. And so I feel we should leave it here. And then we will speak to him out again next time. We'll carry on the last few uh, trading days in his time as a flight engineer and what happened further because he's got a fantastic story to tell in the, in the next episode i'm sure it will come out he got shot by some uh, swapu fighters we call them terrorists but they were fighters and uh, he'll tell us that story his marriage i'm sure that uh, he'll also speak about the passing of his wife and his beloved daughter 
and what happened to Infirmary in life. So, Mark, thank you very much. I really appreciate you. Thank you for contacting me. As always, I say to all of you, come and talk to me. Let those stories not die with you. Bring them so that we can create our legacy here and we can show the world we are proud. We are definitely not ashamed of our service here. And the time has come for us to speak up. So until we meet again, God bless.